Hello, my name is Irina Nevslin, and I'm the chairman of the board of the Museum of the Jewish People, and I'm very happy to have with me here today Lord Jacob Rothschild. Jacob, thank you for coming. Not at all. I know how proud you are to be Jewish. Yes. I know how Zionist you are. Right. And I know that it's, it comes from the family, but it's also very personal for you. And I also know that you, were, you didn't grow up actually in a very Jewish environment. So I want to understand what does it mean to, for you to be Jewish? I mean, if you look at my family history, my father, <clears throat> although he wasn't religious, he was interested in Jewish life. Um, he was involved in Israel. He went to the Weizmann Institute often. He didn't bring his children up to be very aware of that. And it really wasn't until later in life, my early 20s, that I became close to my cousin, Mrs. James de Rothschild, who was rather orthodox. And she invited me to join the board of Yad Hanadiv, which I did when we had four people. And um, that was more than 50 years ago. And since then, uh, the responsibility for which he'd really trained me um, has one I've discharged to the best of my abilities. And we now have 45 people in Jerusalem and um, a large number of projects, including the um, project which I've been now working on for 15 years, which is uh, the new National Library in Israel. So yeah, I'm deeply involved, deeply involved, um, not so much because I'm religious, um, but because I have this wholly strong identification um, with being a Jew uh, and with the country of Israel. W one of the reasons for that is, I mean, the last 50 years have been good times, basically, economically, and we invested the monies of Hanadiv, I think, well. So it's now a big foundation. I think it's the biggest private foundation in Israel. Um, and with that, you have the opportunity to do all sorts of things. So we're working not only on a big flagship project. We do those very occasionally, like the Supreme Court. Then we look after the garden, Ramat Hanadiv, where Baron Edmore is now buried within the garden. Um, we get, I think, 400,000 visitors a year um, and keep it up to good standards. We do a lot um, on education. We do a lot on the environment, which is not a, a subject that's covered very well in Israel. That subject didn't exist last 10 didn't years exist. ago. And we, we felt this is a real opportunity. So if you have environmental problems like water, it was obviously a hugely important subject. If you take Arab-Israeli relationships, we've spent a lot of money with the government in setting up employment centers um, for Arabs. Um, because that's one of the big problems, is unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also new, right? The, the that's Arab a fairly sector. new project. That's a, that's that's a, fairly, a fairly new, new project. project. We've given a certain amount of money towards women's unemployment, particularly uh, Arab women. So we're pretty active across the board, I think, in Hanadiv now. And what about Hanadiv Europe? And, and also Jewish community here, and not also Jewish? Well, it, we, we have another foundation um, called Rothschild Hanadiv Europe, which it's smaller, but it's very active, and we tend to focus more on cultural and um, historic events by supporting um, buildings, synagogues, museums, cultural initiatives, scholarships, and all that. <laughs> Do you remember your first visit to Israel? I remember it very well. I went in 1962, and I was very lucky because I went under the auspices of the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, and I went with him, Nicholas Nabokov, Isaac Stern, the violinist, <laughs> and Raimon von Hoffenstahl, who was the son of uh, um, the Hoffmannstall who <laughs> of Strauss days, um, and life was very different in Israel then. We went round kibbutzes, hearing um, Isaac Stern, Casals, um, Mervyn Rose, Eastermin playing. I understand that you were in Israel, in Jerusalem actually, at the Six Day War. 
I was there, yeah, I had, it was very, uh, it was very odd. I was um, asleep and then the telephone rang and um, it was Marcus Seep, who also was a big influence on my life um, in, in those early days. And he said, we're going. So I said, wow. Wow. <laughs> he said, we're going, to the, we're, going, we're going to the war. I said, OK, I'll get up. And we went to the airport and we flew off. Your kids, do they consider themselves Jewish, religious? Like, how does They're it not happen? religious, but if you take my daughter Hannah, she's uh, very committed to the work of Yad Hanadiv. She's a, a trustee. And um, so they're all, my daughter Beth is actually converting, <laughs> because she's not in, in formal terms Jewish, she's actually converting. And um, she's been to Israel many times, she worked in the botanical gardens there, that's her thing, horticulture. And so yeah, it, it continues, it'll continue. The extraordinary part of the history of the Jews is that for thousands of years that situation has been there. And yet somehow those widely spread Jewish communities kept their spirit through good and bad times. And it's a phenomenon that it's difficult to explain, but, but the light continues. Um, the commitment continues. Even though, of course, you had a very divided Jewish community a hundred years ago, we're going to celebrate the uh, centenary of the Balfour Declaration, which is the kind of Magna Carta of the Jewish people of a hundred years ago, Magna Carta in terms of coming back to their homeland. And um, you had then a difficult choice. I mean, half of my family were very against um, the idea of a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. And um, the other half were for it. Now, that situation will never go away, but the presence of the Jewish community, whether in Israel or outside Israel, I think the light's undimmed. I think it's an extraordinary period. Can you tell now, after 50 years of being involved with Yad and Adiv, which things work and which things don't? In educational terms, um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, I think, again, it's a kind of miracle that um, in science um, and technology, Israel remains at the forefront of the world. Um, how does that happen? Um, it's a complicated question, but it has happened, and they have that um, spirit um, which keeps that going. I think. With the humanities, it's more difficult because we live in an age when the humanities are underfunded by government, where it's not seen to be a priority. But then on the other hand, you look at something like the Israel Museum, which has been a success on a world scale. And so again, in spite of all those difficulties, the um, light continues. What would you wish for younger Jews? I would wish for them, obviously, to be aware of their being Jewish and uh, the, for, the, for the history of the Jewish people to rub off on them to a certain level, to give them the opportunity at least to understand, and that's hopefully that they respond to that. I hope, too, that this creation of the state and home of Israel in what was Palestine is something that younger Jews will visit because that opens their eyes to the Jewish people and a very, very, very important side of uh, the Jewish people today, perhaps the most important side of Jewish people. So awareness is something I would continually underline. Thank you very much. Thank you.